Good morning, good morning, good morning. All glory to God. Sorry, I should have had this set before I... Well, I think we're good. Uh, again, all glory to God for this beautiful, incredible day. It is a day the Lord has made, and I will be glad in it. I will rejoice in it. I will use it to promote Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior at every opportunity. And I will honor God as much as possible. All glory to God. Uh, <clears throat> I want to wait till I know there's a few more people on uh, to explain my uh, choice of shirts today. And quite frankly, it, it was something that less than five minutes ago I changed. And you all understand why in, in a few minutes. Well, it might take an hour, but we'll get there. Again, all glory to God for this incredibly beautiful day. And I thank God that once again that I am given another day and another day to stand before you and speak of God's Word and who God is. And again, all glory to God. Uh, we've had... Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, Chip, you keep right on feeding into my message. <laughs> it's, it's all good. Uh, all glory to God. I, one thing you'll never see me in is a Raider shirt. So anyway, but again, this is all, all feeding directly into a portion of the Word today. But again, all glory to God. Thank God. I know uh, I have promised that when, the God, release, when God released me to do so, that I would, in fact, um, explain a little bit about the Old Testament laws and the different categories. And as God, God being God, and of course I will not stop there. Alright, so with that said, let's pray and get right on into this. I'll be, I'll be honest with you, I... I have been chomping at the bit for the last hour, so let, let's let's pray and get with it. Dear Heavenly Father, good Lord, we thank you for this time. We give you all praise, honor, and glory today, Father, for allowing us to come together, for allowing us to just study your word. And we thank you for the opportunity that you gave us through Jesus Christ to spend eternity with you. And as we examine your word today, Father, may you teach us, teach us all, Father. And may we give you all praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Good morning. God bless you all. Of course, you already know we love you and you cannot do anything about it. We say that, we say it consistently, but I want you to understand something. We take it very seriously as well. When we say you, we love you, it's, it's not something we're just saying to make you feel good. It makes us feel good as well. I used to, my love was very reserved at one time. And it was only for a very select few pe pe people but God. God, that's one of the things that I look back and I give God credit for doing in me. He, he not, he loved me while I was yet a sinner. And he has taught me to love. Not because you love me, but because God loved me. We love you. I love you. Irregardless of your, of your status or your standing with God or your belief of God. I love you. It's that simple. I take that very seriously. 
Okay? And there's something only God could do in me. Because if you knew me before, you knew I could be full of hate. But anyway, all glory to God. Uh, we do love you. So, again, I promise to talk a little bit about the laws and, and where they belong today in a New Testament book believer's life, okay? And before I do, I do have certainly have to give credit where it's due that, as you heard me say before, that statement of we love you and you can't do anything about it became or came from a person that was very, very influential. Wow, we got that word out. In my life, still is today, and of course, a number of you know I'm talking about Pastor Katrina McCray, the one that licensed me into the ministry and taught me a great deal, and I can honestly say that it was her and Aunt, Kath Aunt Kathy's example that led me to love unconditionally because they both certainly did and do. Right. Again, the laws, okay? Uh-oh, somebody loves my jersey. Again, it's funny, and I'll get to it in a moment, into the sermon, why I have this jersey on. I had another shirt on five minutes before I was ready to go live. And the Lord had me change it for a reason. Anyway, let's let's go. The, in in examining laws, let me mention right up front, there are basically three. Some would say four, and they they take basically what they're doing is taking one of the three that I'm going to talk about today and kind of break it down even further. But for the most part, they're ceremonial ceremonial laws civil laws, and moral laws right. mentioned in the Old Testament. These laws have been used to ridicule God. They've been used to ridicule Christians. And, you know, the list goes on. And they've been debated over for, for many years. Okay, but in all reality, they are what they are, and they serve, each of them served a purpose before Jesus. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But let's just break them down here for a moment. The ceremonial laws, okay? And this is Put, look at it like this. This type of law related to Israel's worship. In Leviticus like 1, chapter 1, verse 1 through 13. Okay. The laws pointed forward to Jesus Christ and were no longer necessary after Jesus' death and resurrection. Though we are no longer bound to them, the prim principles Behind the ceremonial laws, the worship and love of God still apply. So let's look at Leviticus uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 13. And I will encourage you, you know, I hope you can have a drink and some snacks because this, this might be, take a moment because some of these scriptures I'm going to be reading and everything the Lord has been dealing with me today might take a minute, but... Again, it's what the Lord wants. So Leviticus 1, verse 1. And the Lord called unto Moses and, and spoke unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice 
of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and then it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. To make atonement for him. That's what there is exactly why it's no longer required today. Jesus made atonement for all of us once for all, settled, never having to do it again. Okay? And of course, I didn't put my finger where I should have. Okay. And he shall kill the bullock before the Lord and the priest, Aaron's sons, shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood round about upon the altar that, that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. And the sons of Aaron, the priest, shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order in order upon the fire and the priests Aaron's sons shall lay the parts the head and the fat in order upon the wood that is on the fire which is upon the altar but his inwards and his legs shall he wash in the water now I'm going to stop there because I think it's made it we've made the point uh, and you could go on and there's other ceremonial laws, a number of ceremonial laws, okay? And you could read on in Leviticus and, and catch a number of them. And, yeah, they are worshiping God in a sense, but... Those things, those type of laws, what we refer to as the ceremonial laws, are no longer needed today. Quite frankly, you could end up in jail <laughs> if, if you did some of these ceremonial laws today. Cause, but the point being, they're no longer necessary because of what Jesus did on the cross, if that makes sense. Okay, he became a sacrifice. He became our um, offering for atonement. He became the forgiveness of our sins. Okay, and so these laws have absolutely no place in today's society. If you come across a, a religion or a denomination or whatever that is still doing this or practicing some sort of similarity to that, it's a cult. And run. You get away from there as fast as possible. Some of it may even be illegal, a lot of them might be illegal in today's society. You know, there are those that were sacrificing human beings. Okay, and I mean, that is absolutely cultish and demonic in nature. And so, again, these, those that practice this have most certainly not accepted Jesus. They're still, they're still living under these laws and under the assumption that salvation can be earned or that your sins can be atoned. It's something you earn as opposed to accepting the free gift of Jesus Christ. So again, these ceremonial laws have no place in a New Testament Christian's life. They are obsolete.
And so that's the first areas of, uh, of the law that in this breakdown, we'll see as we go on, there are laws that can still apply today are still applicable, but not because they're laws. Okay. So let, let's move on to what is referred to as the civil laws. Okay. And I will tell you, for those that are following along in the Word, that we'll be in Deuteronomy 24, and start in verse 5, but before that, let me say this. Civil law. This law dictated Israel's daily living. Okay. But modern society and culture are so radically different that some of these guidelines cannot be followed specifically. The principles behind the commands are to guide our conduct. So we're in Deuteronomy chapter 24. I'm going to start in verse 5. Okay. And read as far as the Holy Spirit uh, wants me to. Okay. So again, Deuteronomy 24, starting at verse 5. When a man has taken a new wife, he shall not go out, out to war, neither shall he be charged with any with any business, but he shall be free at home one year and shall cheer up, cheer up his wife, which he has taken. Well, one year. Let's hope today she is already cheered up. But anyway, no man shall take the nether or the upper millstone to pledge, for he taketh, taketh a man's life to pledge. If a man be found stealing any of his brethren of the children of Israel and maketh mer merchandise of him or selleth him, then that thief shall die and shall and thou shalt put evil away from among you. Take heed in the plague of leprosy that thou observe diligently and do according to all that the priests, the Levites, shall teach you. As I commanded them, so ye shall observe to do. Remember what the Lord thy God did unto Myram, by the way, after that ye were come forth out of Egypt. When thou doest lend thy brother anything, thou shalt not go into his house to fetch his pledge. Thou shalt stand abroad, and the man to whom thou, thou doest lend, bring out the pledge abroad unto thee. So you don't need to go in after anything, okay? You don't need to go after and badger someone if you lent it to them. You know, the Word of God tells us to only lend what we can afford to not get back, basically. Paraphrasing. Okay. And if the man be poor, thou shalt not sleep with his pledge. In any case, thou shalt deliver him the pledge again when the sun goeth down, that he may sleep in his own ram raiment and bless thee. And it shall be righteous unto thee before the Lord thy God. So we have laws today, okay? Civil laws, okay? Civilian laws, if you'll allow me to, get, to use that term. And we shouldn't break them. And again, these are laws that if you're living godly, you're not going to break them. You know, my, just as a silly example, um, I don't know, I not so much in Coshocton, but I know in other towns, especially bigger towns, there's certain areas where you can't park in certain times of the day. And if you do, you'll get towed. I actually had that happen in Cincinnati uh, when we were, uh, I think we were celebrating our first anniversary or 
whatever, and uh, woke up the next morning with a car gone because someone told us we could park in a certain area to a hotel. You know, it worked out to our good. They paid for the taxi for us to go get our car and gave us a free night stay, which more than covered what it took to get our car back. But the point being, that's a, a civil law. Don't park here during these hours. We frankly still need to keep those laws. You know, for one thing, if you don't, then you're you're kind of in one sense in a way uh, chipping away at your testimony, chipping away. You know, especially if you just blatantly ignore what we call civil laws today. It's and people see you doing that, they're like, Did I didn't I see him at church Sunday? But he has no respect for people or the law. I mean, this, I'm just being real with you. That's exactly what happens. I've been there. I've seen it happen. I've, se I've seen people look, look at others and say, didn't he tell us he was Christian? When we were sitting on break at work last week in the break room, didn't he tell us he, he believed in God? So yes, we should keep what are referred to as civil laws. So let's go one step further and look at the third third area. Moral laws. And for those that want to go there, we'll be in Exodus 20. And these scriptures, although you may or may not have read them, should bring some familiarity. Okay. You'll understand why in a moment, but even the vast majority of unsaved people have heard about these scriptures. Even though you may, as an unsafe person, may never have read them, the vast majority have in some way, shape, or form heard about them. And it's Exodus 20, and I'm going to start in verse 1, actually. And I'll be reading, as again, as much as the Lord requires me to read. All right, verse 20. I'm sorry, Exodus 20, verse 1. Okay. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other God before me. Now, that should be, you should all know exactly what these scriptures refer to. And if you haven't guessed, we're talking about the Ten Commandments. This is where they were given originally. Okay? Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is the, in the earth beneath. Let me stop here for a second. We read the Ten Commandments, or we take a list of the Ten Commandments, and they're very, most of the time, they'll be a very short sentence, okay? And I believe that we need to look at the expanded version, the way they were given right here in Exodus, to get a better understanding. Because, frankly, and I'm going, I'm going to let it out of the bag right now, okay? These still apply today. These laws, the moral laws, are still valid. They cannot give you salvation. I got to need you to understand. Keeping these laws will not lead you to salvation. 
It's only through the acceptance of Jesus Christ and the free gift of him dying for your sins and your sicknesses is the way to salvation. But as part of that, as to live a godly, righteous life, we need to understand that the moral laws are still part of a godly, righteous life. Okay, I don't know where I left off, but anyway, I'll find it. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the inequity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me. And keep my commandments. He goes on. Verse 7. Thou shalt not take the name of the, of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Again, forgiveness is offered. It says he will not hold them guiltless. In other words, he, God will say, you sinned. But understand, Jesus died for our sins. So don't read that and think, oh, you know, I said that blah, blah, back in, you know, 1975, so I guess I'm on my way to hell. No, you ask God to forgive you. And he did. He's simply saying, if you do this without repentance, look out. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord. Okay, I'm sorry. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is, is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Hmm. So let, let me jump on I'm going to skip the rest of that I know that's not what I said but I'm done, going to anyway <laughs> honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee we've seen that expressed in the commandment with a promise and is said that if you honor your father and your mother you will be given long life is is in the new testament it talks about you know giving us longer life and that's exactly what it said uh that thy days may be long upon the land and let's see verse 13 thou shalt not kill it's still wrong to kill today thou shalt not commit adultery it's still wrong today Thou shalt not steal. Jesus repeated things similar to this in the New Testament. Okay, Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And quite frankly, I, I summarize that as thou shalt not lie. Because anytime you lie, you're more than likely bearing false witness. You're either bearing false witness against your neighbor or quite frankly, it could be against yourself. But you're bearing false witness. And that neighbor is interesting here because we will get into that and what a neighbor here in a few minutes. And so when it says against thy neighbor, quite frankly, it could be anybody. It could be someone you you never actually was introduced to but you saw them in a mall. I'm just going to give you this example. Okay? You you saw someone. Here's your friend, and here's, here's this other guy. And your friend steals something out of a store. And everybody gets, you know, they shut the doors, the cops show up, and... cop asked you what happened. You said, well, see this guy over here? 
He stole it. He had, he's the one that actually stole it. Trying to protect your friend. Well, that guy that you're pointing your finger at qualifies as your neighbor because he's standing next to you. Okay, it's not, as as we'll see, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but it's, proximity has nothing to do with it. You know, I have neighbors here that live next door on all sides, okay? And yes, they're my neighbors, but that's not what the Bible is referring to here here or anywhere else, quite frankly, when it says neighbor, it's referring to whoever's around you at that any at any given moment. We'll see a better explanation of that in, in a minute. Anyway, reading on, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his maid ser manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And that was talking about a donkey, by the way. And when these were given, this is how important they were to God. I just, I, I glanced ahead here and it says this. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightning and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking and when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. These, when these commandments were given, it struck some fear in some people. Okay? They wanted to hear what the Lord said, but they wanted to hear it from Moses. They saw how important this was to God. Right? Right up front. And so, we need to go back and not read that little plaque on your wall, but to delve deeper and actually look at the scriptures. And again, these are considered moral laws. There are others expressed in the Bible but most of them can be pointed back to one of these. And they most certainly still are valid today. You show me in the Bible where it says it's okay to kill, where it's okay to commit adultery, or to steal. You will not find scripture where it, it changes these commandments. Okay, the... The ceremonial laws, as we saw, they were changed. They were changed with Jesus, Jesus Christ on the cross. So it's no longer valid for us to try to sacrifice an animal for our sins. But you can't show me anywhere. And so Jesus changed that. And it's very, very evident and very plain as we read through the New, New Testament scriptures. I mean, you look at even the book of Hebrews right off the top. It, it says, and uh, that's one example, okay? But it says, he was sacrificed once for all. And it talks about, in Hebrews, it even talks about what the priest used to do. That we just read a few moments ago. What they used to do. But it says that that, that is no longer necessary. Very openly, very plainly, very blatantly points out that these ceremonial laws are obsolete. So don't come knocking on my door with a with a a uh, unblemished goat, because I'm not sacrificing it. <laughs> yeah, I got through in a little humor because. No, if you, if you bring that unblemished animal to my door, I'm going to tell you about Jesus and what he did. And your unblemished animal is going to go home with you. As a pet or whatever, food, whatever the case may be. Because I'm not taking it out of my backyard. I, I hope that's clear. I know I'm dwelling and 
maybe throwing in a little humor, but that, that's all good. All glory to God. So we see ceremonial laws obsolete. Civil and war laws vastly still are valid today. They cannot, nor will they ever, be a way into heaven. They simply come with righteous living. Yes, they are a part of righteous living. I, I cannot and will not deny that. Okay. When we give our life to Christ, you know, Jesus himself teaches, and the Word of God throughout teaches us, when we give our life to Christ, well, as a matter of fact, on Tuesday evenings, we're, still, we're in the book of Romans, that makes it very clear. We just read last week, it's not okay to go on sinning. Quite frankly, that's making a mockery of God. No, Jesus Christ died for us, that our sins were forgiven. But he, we are also called into righteousness. Be ye righteous, for I am righteous. There it is. Okay? And so, we need to, to stop those things and keep these laws, but not as a way of earning salvation. As a way of expressing that we have salvation. Let me say that again, as a way of expressing we have been saved and we want to live a godly life. That's why they apply. And since we're on commandments and laws, I wanted to take this a step further today, and this is why God had me wait. I know it is. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt. I've been promising that I would talk about this uh, for a number of weeks now, and I didn't understand why God, why God, why not this Sunday? And of course, you know, that's something God never answers, but he always had, had something else for me. But when he released me to do this today, he almost immediately began dealing with me on this part. And again, I'm going to Matthew chapter 22 here because Jesus, I mean, we all know he was the perfect one. But he had a way of putting things that made them undeniable and made them so clear. I understood that he spoke to his, his disciples and his apostles in parables, but eventually those parables were clarified. But in this particular case, Jesus just absolutely sums thing, things up so plainly when we just put a little bit of time and effort into studying it. And we're Matthew 22, and I'm going to start in verse 37. Let me grab the page because it looks like I might be flipping. All right. Matthew 22, verse 37 starting out, I'm going to read through 40. Jesus said unto him, let me back up. Someone said to Jesus, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? So he's, he's asking, he's, this, he's asking Jesus, what is the great commandment in the law? And this is Jesus' answer. He says, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. 
and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor, you just heard me talk about neighbor, okay, as thyself. On these two commandments, understand this, and this is something I really need for you to grab a hold of today. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. I read that and I just, the presence of God just, just hits me like a ton of bricks. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, if that's true, and we really want to understand what applies today. Don't you think we should grab a hold of what this is saying? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Let's just examine that for a moment. The heart. Matthew chapter 6. In verse 19. Again, that's Matthew 6, 19. And I'll be reading through 21. The heart. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. And here's the key. For where your heart, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So, if we're going to love God with all of our heart, we need to be laying up for ourselves treasures in heaven. He wants us to lay up our treasures in heaven. Not here on earth. Because where you lay up your treasures exposes your heart. And if he says to love God with all your heart, then where is your treasure? I'm not here for material possession. God said he would supply all my needs. So I don't even need to ask him for those. I need to be laying up treasures in heaven through prayer and reading the word and supplication and worship. That's laying up treasures in heaven. Telling people about Jesus. Laying up treasure in heaven. Living for God. Laying up treasure in heaven. That's loving him with all your heart. So see, these aren't idle words that Jesus spoke. There, it's, he's giving us a way to live. He's showing us what we need to be keeping here. He's breaking down the law so simply. And I must say this, if you keep these two commandments, you don't have to worry about what, what the Old Testament says or what, what carries over to the New Testament. If you keep these two commandments, you won't break anything else. Let's look at the soul. The soul is kind of, it's like our spirit within us. And, you know, we have a spirit and God's spirit came to live within us. What does it say in Matthew chapter 5? Okay, and, and also in Psalm 51, it talks about a broken and contrite spirit. I want to get very specific here on Matthew 5, if you'll allow me to find it. 
It's actually um, okay. I, I want to look. I'm, I'm going to Matthew five here for just a moment. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Your heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. You don't have evil thoughts. You don't seek revenge. You don't hate. Your heart has been purified. But back to the soul... I should know these better than I do, but blessed are are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of of heaven. Poor in spirit, you've given way to God's spirit. You you've allowed God's spirit to come in and take control over yours, and that our soul. We've we've allowed the Holy Spirit to come in. And take control over our soul. Okay. Matthew 16.26 says this. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? The reason for the shirt? This is my soul. No, I'm not saying I live for the brown. I'm simply saying when I'm of my own mind and my own thoughts, I support the Cleveland Browns. I am a sports fanatic, quite frankly, in my own. That's a, to, I, you, that is an example of my soul. We all have things that we desire here on earth. One day before God calls me home or Jesus shows up, I would love to see the Browns at least make it to the Super Bowl. Maybe even win it. But that's my soul. And that's but I need for my soul to be focused on God. What what's the scripture say? It says to love God with all your heart soul, and mind. This, in my eternity, means nothing. If given a choice between watching the Cleveland Browns and going and preaching somewhere, if someone called me, you know, at 12.01 or 1230 this afternoon, and when we come and, and speak somewhere, I have a choice between that, God's, the Holy Spirit within me, and to love God with all my soul, or to succumb to my soul and, and say, oh, I can't, you know, the Browns are on one o'clock. No. He wants us to love Him with all of our soul. When we have an opportunity to represent Him, then that's what He wants us to do. He wants our, and we'll go to the mind here in a moment, okay? But He wants the whole of us focused on Him. Let's look at the mind real quick. And we're going to go to Romans chapter 8. Okay, Romans 8, verses 5 and 6. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So when he says heart, soul, and mind, 
when he's talking of the mind, he says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. For those who live to see the browns at one o'clock, nothing wrong with that. But those who live according to the Spirit, for those that would forsake watching the Browns to go tell someone about Jesus, they mind the things of the Spirit. So, when Jesus said, and I need to get back there so I can read it correctly. Back to Matthew 22. Should have kept my finger there, I guess. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. So when he said that, that's what he's talking about. Where is your mind? That old that little cliche. Carol, you didn't have to tell me that right now. <laughs> I'm glad you did. But. Give me a minute, people. That one kind of hit home. So anyway, you know, this is actually kind of a good example. I'm going to read it. Please pray for the family of Ron Davis, Reverend Davis as he went home with Jesus last night. He was very, also very influential in my life. Oh, I could talk for another hour just about that. But my mind, my fleshly mind, again, grieves. But I know where he, this man is. And so, my mind, loving God with all my mind, knows that he gained a precious soul last night. That Reverend Davis is, no, is in no more pain. He has been very influential in this area. And, and he will most certainly be very much missed. But, again, he was one that had his heart, soul, and mind focus on Jesus. Oh, yeah. So let's look at the second part of that verse for just a moment. Or the second, next verse, verse 20, 21. I'm sorry. Never mind, I got way late here. Let me go back. The second verse, verse 39. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And you heard me talk about neighbor a little bit ago, but I want to give you a scriptural example and I'm going over to the book of Luke in chapter 10 and again if you've studied the word at all or even a lot of unsaved people have um, heard this particular story okay and I'm going to be in Luke chapter 10 I'm going to start in 28 And this is absolutely not right. I copied down the wrong verse. 
but I'm going to ask, and I wish I could find it, I'm sorry, I should probably know better. Um, somebody let me know where the scripture, and you can look it up, Google search really quick, the Good Samaritan. I want to know where that story is, or I can paraphrase it. And if somebody will do that, I'll, I'll go ahead and read it. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and continue here. But neighbor, and when we read the scriptures of, of basically a good Samaritan, I'm going to paraphrase really quickly. There was a man laying injured along the side of the road. And one person walks by, looks at him, keeps going. Another person walks by, keeps going, okay? The third person, a Samaritan, not someone that recognized Jesus as the Messiah, 1029, thank you, I don't know where. I was in the right spot. Great. Ten, I thought, okay, I did have it right. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, do this, and thou shalt live. Verse 29, But he, willing to justify himself, himself said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his remnant and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. Oh my. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Walk to the other side of the road. I don't want nothing to do with this. Okay. And likewise, a Levite. This is someone who believed in the Messiah. When he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, the next day, when he departed, he took out two pence, or cash, and gave them to the host, to the innkeeper, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendeth more, in other words, if it takes more than these two pence, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three, this is still Jesus talking, thinkest thou, which one do you think was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And the man answered and said, He that showed mercy on him. And Jesus said this, Go and do likewise. See, neighbor has nothing to do with the fact that somebody lives next door to you or behind you or in front of you or across the street. That has nothing to do with what the Bible considers neighbor. So, again, when we read those scriptures, and I wish I quit closing my Bible...
When we read those two commandments that Jesus spoke of, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There's no need to argue over what, what laws still apply and what laws don't apply. There's no, there's no need to... To really even go back and do what I did today and break down these commandments or these, these laws. When we focus on what Jesus Christ knew as New Testament believers, when we focus on what he said was the most important commandments, then you're not going to break any law. Any commandment. That's what we need to grab a hold of. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's an excellent example. Chip just wrote, yeah, I don't know, for those of you, he, uh, I forget what, what title it is, but he goes where, Accidents are and secures the highway and what have you and helps helps out police. Okay, and he just wrote, he was at an accident scene and a person involved, someone involved in the accident, prayed for everyone else involved. That's being a neighbor. See, that those people, those other people, were there in this person's presence. Freeway Safety Patrol. Thank you. So they became his neighbor. And because of his heart and soul and mind being focused on Jesus, he recognized them as neighbors. And love them with prayer. Thank you for that example. And I hope one that we we have brought some clarity to the Old Testament laws today. You could go and study them a little deeper and break them down a little a little finer if you choose. But what I'm telling you here now is to focus on Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. You focus on those, and you will have no need to break down any Old Testament laws. You will be in line with what God told us to do, to live righteously. You will be laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven, And you will not break any of the Ten Commandments. I've said that many times. You keep those two and really understand what God was talking about, heart, soul, and mind, and neighbor. When you get, get it in your mind what Jesus really meant with those, and you keep those two, it's all going to fall right in line for you. Yes, it's good to know the Ten Commandments. But it's also good to know that if we love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind, and love our neighbor as ourselves, we won't break any of those. Alright? So, all glory to God. All glory to God. Let's go out and be New Testament believers. Never meet someone and not love them instantly. Never come across someone 
and think of them as anything other than a neighbor and an opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus. Praise God. And I would be out of line if I didn't right now take the opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus. I'm here to tell you, He died for your sins. He died for your sicknesses. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Him. Okay? And that's what I offer to you today. If you don't know Jesus, I'm offering, I'm, I'm telling you, He freely gives. He freely forgives. And if anything that's been said today has sparked something in your heart that you want to know this Jesus, that you want to live this righteousness that I've been talking about, it's very simple. Repeat this prayer after me. Just say, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you, a sinner, in need of a Savior. Forgive me of all my wrongdoings. I receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Again, all glory to God. I thank God for this time. I thank you for all for staying with me. I have no clue what time it is. I intentionally do not watch a clock. I intentionally don't have one. Because I'm done with it. He's done. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, for this time. We thank you, Father, that you have allowed us to examine your word today, Father. Thank you that you taught us more about your word, that in doing so, we have drawn closer to you and that you have drawn closer to us, Father. May we go and live out those two simple commandments that Jesus Christ gave us, laying up for ourselves treasures in heaven, In Jesus' precious name, amen. Yeah, God bless you all. We love you. And of course, you cannot do anything about it. Don't bother trying. You can run from it. You can ignore it. But you cannot stop it. All right. Praise God. I will see you Tuesday. Romans chapter 7, I believe. We're getting into some interesting chapters in Romans, as if they weren't already. But again, all glory to God. Tamara will, of course, be here Thursday. Always give God the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless.